I suspect what is not being said here is that there's, there's a particular reason why I was asked to do this. And, and, and the reason was that uh, a while ago, I hadn't written anything for Saxis, and Fazilla asked me to write something. And I then proceeded to persecute her, I think, for a couple of weeks with, with, bar with barrages of questions which were much along the lines of who are you talking to and what are you trying to say to them, etc. And the reason I was doing that is that I think that it's, I mean, it, 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 it's surprisingly often that, that one has to remind oneself and, and colleagues who write in the public space uh, that actually we're not, I assume that none of us are simply doing it because uh, we, we, we're narcissistic. We're not simply doing it because we feel that our voices ought to be heard. We are doing it because we do want to change society. Uh, and if we do want to change society, then we have to be particularly mindful of uh, what to me is, is, is the cardinal question that anybody writing anything has to ask, which is, you know, who am I writing this for and why am I, why am I writing it? Um, and that obviously assumes uh, that we also get away from the fairly naive view, which I, I doubt anybody in this room uh, uh, t takes particularly seriously, but which some people do, that somehow you simply put ideas out there, and if they're good ideas, then intelligent people realize that they're good ideas, uh, and, and, and they get adopted. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons which uh, many of us have, 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 have read about, uh, which indicate that that is not, not, not so. Um, so we aren't just writing for everybody, we are writing for a purpose and I think therefore we need to debate uh, what that purpose is uh, and what the rationale is for what we're doing. So, so that's what I'm going to try to do and it's, I'm going to try to do two things. I'm going to try to propose, no doubt to be shot down by colleagues etc, to propose a particular framework for, for why I think we ought to address this issue in a particular way and then give some specifics of issues where, which, which, which I think uh, this pertains to. Uh, and I think that the, the, the framework uh, that we need to start with is uh, how do ideas change society? And that, that's a big question and I don't want to deal with all of it. But I think, and I'm being immensely crude here to a certain extent, I think that the traditional view uh, of people, you know, and I'm talking about at the time I was growing up intellectually, the traditional view of people uh, who were trying to change society, uh, particularly in the circumstances we found ourselves in uh, when, when uh, this, the country was, was, was officially ruled by a minority, whereas now it's unofficially ruled by a minority, but that's another bit of um, At that particular stage, uh, the dominant view, the one that we were all brought up on uh, at the universities, etc., was what I call in a, in a book on Harold Wolpe, which thank heaven is finally being published in six weeks' time. Uh, what I call the polarization paradigm. And the polarization paradigm was essentially the idea that uh, society was divided between the powerless and the powerful. Uh, the powerful would never give up power unless they were forced to do so by the powerless. Uh, and therefore the purpose of uh, engaging in intellectual activity in support of social change, which obviously exclude, includes the kind of thing we, 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 we do when we write for outlets like Sexus, uh, is a process of trying to place information in the hands uh, of the oppressed uh, which would enable them to change society. This is a very important activity. Uh, but the uh, assumption behind this was uh, that uh, if you wasted your time talking to the powerful, uh, it was either futile or positively counterproductive because uh, either you were simply achieving nothing or you were placing information in the hands of powerful people which would be used to make sure that they remained powerful. Now, I think those who, who've, who've looked at any of my work will know that you know, I started criticizing the polarization paradigm sometime in the 1980s and I haven't stopped since. Uh, I think that that's an inappropriate way of looking at how societies change. Uh, and in a nutshell, I think, and I've been doing some very rarefied academic work on this, uh, using the work of a colleague called John Hoffman at, at, at Leicester, who's, who's, who's written, I think, some very powerful uh, work on the question of, of change. Uh, 
uh, is that uh, change is always an incremental process. Uh, and that doesn't mean that one accepts the existing order as it is. It means that change from one order to another is a much more complicated process than the paradigm, polarization paradigm tells us it is. I mean, in a nutshell, uh, the, 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 the experiments uh, or, or the events in recent uh, human history, and by recent one means the last century and a half, um, in which uh, that kind of paradigm has been used, in which previous orders have been overthrown and the state has been seized and a new order has been instituted, have, 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 besides being fairly rare exceptions, have, if you look at the evidence, not actually changed nearly as much as they purport to change. In fact, the power structures of the society have tended to remain intact uh, with, with, with new occupants. On the other hand, I, I think you can demonstrate, and I'm thinking of work here like, if those, for those of you who take an interest in academic work, work like Adam Shavorsky's Capitalism and Social Democracy, uh, as, as, as well as uh, various other works that I could mention. Uh, I think that there is uh, an argument to be made uh, which I certainly do make for the idea that structure, that, that incremental power shifts over periods of time uh, can become qualitative, which I guess is, a, is an abstract way of saying uh, that once power starts shifting, uh, the capacity is developed for power to shift a great deal more. Uh, and I developed my own ideas on this. I, I, this isn't becoming too sort of self-indulgent, but uh, if I, on my work in the, on the trade union movement in the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, and I try to develop the argument in, 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 in a book called Building Tomorrow Today on, on the trade union movement at the time. And the idea behind Building Tomorrow Today was that the incremental gains which the trade unions were making were actually leading to significant power shifts which were becoming cumulative over time. So whether that, uh, you know, whether you agree with that perspective or not, that is, that is my perspective. Uh, I certainly don't, I'm certainly not of the view that, that uh, changing power structures is, 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 is not conducive to change. I mean, quite clearly in South Africa that would be a rather silly argument to make, but you could have had uh, any sort of meaningful change here and, until the, 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 the control of the state changed. Uh, I'm simply saying uh, that the argument is that it's a more complicated process than that and that uh, first of all, changes in state power are only one of the ways in which society changes. Uh, and secondly, uh, that uh, change uh, is always a subtler and more incremental process than the polarization paradigm tells it is. Now, the reason for putting this particular theory of change on the table is that it quite clearly informs how we would go about the kind of activity that people who write for Saxus engage in. Uh, because clearly if the par polarization paradigm is right, and if one is concerned purely about uh, 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 advancing social change, which I presume everybody in the room is, uh, <coughs> well then what Saxus ought to be doing and what people who write for Saxus ought to be doing uh, is uh, simply addressing themselves to the powerless, uh, hopefully assisting the powerless uh, with information and insight which, which will enable them uh, to change power relations. Now, uh, if you accept the argument that I'm making, then yes, uh, that is certainly something which, which contributes to change. One would have to have a debate about whether Saxus is the appropriate vehicle uh, to do that. Uh, you know, if, they, if, if there are multiple strategies, there can also be multiple vehicles. Uh, but certainly, uh, and that is the assumption on which I've operated for most of my professional life, talking to elites matters. Uh, and as Fazila says, I've done far too much talking for elite, to elites, and it's not always a barrel of laughs, etc. But the assumption is that talking to elites matters. Now, now let me get rid of some of the naive assumptions. It, it, it doesn't matter in, <laughs> in every situation at every time. Uh, I think the best way in which I can illustrate, just a concrete example, of how, I think, of, of, of how I think talking to elites works is once again to talk about a personal experience uh, which was <coughs> the experience of writing uh, on labor issues for the financial mail in the, in the, in the 1970s and the early 1980s. Uh, and it was a remarkable experience because up until the end of the 1970s, 
it, was, it was possibly the most frustrating job imaginable. We, we, we would write this stuff about trade unions and bargaining rights, etc. And we didn't even get any hostility. They just, their eyes glazed over. They weren't even listening. It was kind of incomprehending responses, etc. Of course, uh, late 79, VIHA and the growth of the trade union movement, by early 1980, we were in the midst of a massive strike wave, which you could argue hasn't ended 34 years later. And suddenly, literally, it was one of the most bizarre experiences I've ever had in my life. People who had ignored us entirely were quoting our own work back at us as, it was, as though it was their opinion. So suddenly, what had become so weird that uh, you didn't even talk about it uh, was in the mainstream. Uh, and yes, you can make the obvious point that they might have been quoting it back, but they didn't really mean it, etc. Uh, all of those points are valid up to, up to the point. But uh, I think the point I'm trying to make from this experience is uh, that if one is realistic, if one recognizes, yes, uh, the essential, none, of, none of what I'm describing could possibly have happened if there weren't any strikes in the first place, if there wasn't a trade union movement in the first place. Uh, but when that trade union movement exists and when those strikes occur, uh, the question of how elites respond become absolutely crucial. And the reason the, re the elite responses become absolutely crucial is that simply the kind of assumptions about power and how power shifts, which are, are lie behind the power, uh, uh, polarization paradigm, uh, don't express reality in a number of other ways. And, and, and there are two points I want to make about this. The first point I want to make about this is one of, the, one of, one of Shavorsky's arguments in Capitalism and Social Democracy, which, uh, which I endorse, uh, is the idea that, that contrary to the original expectations of socialist thinkers, uh, for a variety of reasons, there has never been a society in which the organized working class has actually been the majority. Okay? So because uh, the, the working, uh, organized working class has never been a majority, uh, it, me it, it meant that the organized working class had to form alliances and had to form coalitions uh, in order to, to pursue its agendas. And this was true, I think, in every every situation where, where society did change dramatically, uh, whether you're talking about revolutionary socialist models or you're talking about social democratic models. Uh, and once you start talking about the need for coalitions, uh, there's obviously a need to talk across spaces to people who are not necessarily uh, on, on, on your side of the fence. Uh, much more recently, I, I tried to develop some of this thinking in, in work on the treatment action campaign. Uh, the second point is that generally uh, the, 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 the what, what happens to uh, popular resistance and what happens to popular mobilization is certainly dependent to a considerable degree on how elites react, on the kind of strategic calculations that elites made. Uh, and, and in my own experience, I mean, this was brought home to me very vividly in uh, we are being able to do screeds of interviews with apartheid-era bureaucrats at the time in which the society was changing, in the sense in which the kind of debates which occurred there certainly had, you know, I'm not saying for a moment that, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, the, the motor of popular resistance wasn't primary, but the kind of, so kind of responses which elite, uh, bureau which, which apartheid-era bureaucrats uh, 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 you know, had over that time were very important. And, and just one example, I mean, I, I, I think to be realistic, and, uh, you know, a lot of people would behave indignantly, but I think, you know, the, the truth is more uncomfortable, uh, comfortably close to, 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 to the bone than people might imagine. Uh, had the apartheid state locked up about 100 people in the late 1970s, it would have effectively closed down the trade union movement. Now, it may not have closed down the trade union movement forever, and I'm sure it wouldn't have closed it down. Uh, but had it done that, uh, the, the, the progression of, of bargaining rights and the way in which that particular uh, process developed would have been far messier, uh, far more difficult, etc. And therefore, it becomes very important, I think, to engage with elites. Uh, and if one is engaging with elites, obviously the question of that I raised at the beginning, the question of who are we talking to and why are we talking to them and what are we trying to say, uh, is very important because uh, you know that, that's where we get into matters of technique. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, one does not, you know, one needs to have strategic ways of engaging with those elites, which uh, you know you, one, one 
sort of develops by trial and error as the process goes on. Now, I said at the beginning that I'm not simply making the point that it's always a good idea to, 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 to do this. I think in most cases it's a good idea to do it, even when things look quite bleak. But there are, I think it is very important to read the environment one is in to get a sense of what may be strategically useful at some times and, and, and what is uh, strategically uh, not that useful. Um, now, uh, in, in work I've done on, on, on you know, sort of advising various social justice organizations, etc., and I mean, it's a very crude kind of thing, but it, it enables us, I think, to think about certain things. I've asked people to think about the, idea, the, the difference between closed and open policy environment. And essentially, a closed policy environment is one in which you, you have to be in for the long haul. There is, there is no particular reason to suppose that things are going to shift very quickly, very soon. Uh, and therefore, if you are engaging with elites, what you are trying to do in that particular situation is create a climate of opinion which will be useful at some future date. Now, the best example in the post-apartheid period I can find, and I think sadly if you've been following the media recently, nothing much has changed, uh, of, of a very closed policy environment or of a, of, of a seriously closed policy environment which, which colleagues have done work on, it's, it's the whole question of migration uh, and, and, and the right particularly of people from elsewhere in the continent to live here. Uh, uh, that, is not, that is not an easy argument to win. There isn't terribly much elite support for the idea despite various uh, sanctimonious statements about xenophobia uh, and therefore when we at the Center for Policy Studies uh, in the 90s started dealing with these issues my advice to colleagues was you know prepare yourself for a very long haul what what you say now is not going to be taken terribly seriously uh, right now uh, but hopefully it will matter later on uh, and then you have open policy environments or relatively open policy environments and those of course environments in which despite the fact that uh, there, are, you know, there are serious power dynamics there, which are obstacles, there is a, a realistic prospect uh, of uh, forming alliances, a realistic prospect uh, of uh, getting the kind of reactions I talked about when I talked about uh, why apartheid bureaucrats didn't recommend locking up the trade union movement. Uh, and in those cases, uh, obviously, uh, elite engagement matters a great deal. Now, uh, I think if we look at the environment at the moment, uh, to start getting specific about it, uh, and I think you know, here is the situation in which those of us who do this kind, you know, who take this kind of perspective, very often get uh, get accused of 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 uh, sort of being Pollyanna, you know, of this kind of constant, needless optimism. During the 1980s, for what it's worth, one of my colleagues at one unit I was working with, who's now a sort of senior bureaucrat, uh, used to call me Spielberg. And the reason, <laughs> the reason he used to call me Spielberg is he said, well, whenever you write about strategy, you say we've got space. <laughs> you know, you're the spaceman. <laughs> and we don't have any space except in your head, you know. But I think that if one, uh, you know, if one keeps one's ears open, uh, there are very often opportunities uh, which do not seem terribly likely, but I think are there. And right now, to a lot of people's surprise, I think that there is, perhaps not so much to people's surprise, I think an issue on which there is sub significant opportunity at the moment is inequality. Um, you can be cynical about it, but I don't think that it's an accident that Thomas Piketty's book is sold out all over the place. Uh, and literally you kind of go into, you know, airport bookshops, etc., and people are trying to get hold of it. Uh, I think that if you do spend time, as I unfortunately do, reading what is in business day, um, uh, it is quite interesting to me that people are actually writing. I mean, my ex-wife has discovered inequality. You can't, you know, that is a major breakthrough. She wrote a piece about it the other day. <laughs> um, and the response is very interesting. I mean, you know, you know, besides my ex, I mean, one of the one of the one of the Business Day people who who writes about markets, etc., wrote this fascinating piece on Piketty, which in effect said, "I hate this stuff. I don't want to believe in it, uh, but it all seems logical to me." So I'm confused about what to do next. Now, obviously, 
And I think that illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. That does not mean that we now have masses of financial journalists and business people rushing around the country trying to work out what to do about inequality. Uh, it simply means that there are opportunities which were there before, which were there, which, are not, uh, which, which have not been there before. Uh, and I think that that, that does create uh, a very interesting space uh, to, to, to open up debates on this issue. Um, once again, I must clarify, if I haven't clarified it earlier, you know, I, I, I think that if one, if, if one agrees with me about the need for elite engagement, as Fazila said in the introduction, uh, you know, one has to have very modest goals of what one's trying to achieve, quite frankly. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, you're not suddenly opening the minds of all sorts of people in elite positions to uh, all sorts of things they haven't considered before. Uh, but you are creating strategic bridgeheads, you are creating a situation in which uh, people are hopefully beginning to recognise uh, either that various courses of action are, are strategically closed, which were open to them in the past, or that uh, they need to do some things which they haven't done in the past. So I think that's uh, the first point I want to make about current issues. I think that there is uh, a serious discussion to be had uh, about inequality at the moment. I must say that I remain, although I think it's absolutely crucial, uh, I think what to me, despite the massive inequalities in our society, uh, is, is a less propitious environment, but, but, but one which, which, which perhaps one has to take seriously anyway, uh, is race. Uh, it is far more difficult to talk about race in the society than it is to talk about inequality. I mean, I, I'm reminded of this all the time. You know, if you, if you want, I mean, just a, a sort of gratuitous tip, okay, which probably most of you know, if you really want to draw attention to yourself, write something about race, okay? It doesn't matter what you write about race, people will, hurl, you know, half the, half the people will hurl abuse at you, the other half of the people will cheer you on, etc. Uh, I mean, I sometimes imagine, I'm probably exaggerating it, I, I sometimes imagine that you could write you could write an article in Business Day calling for the immediate socialization of the means of production and you get like five letters from people saying maybe this is not a bad idea, not a good idea. Uh, you write about race and you suddenly have everybody kind of descending on you to demand to know why you're trying to destroy the white race, etc. So uh, it, it's an extraordinarily difficult issue at the moment and, 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 and oddly if we get back to the old race and class debates we used to have, uh, uh, class is an easier issue to have debates on in South Africa today uh, than races. I think more generally, it's just worth looking and, 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 and I was asked, and I am going to close with this, and I was asked to look specifically at this, although I did <coughs> address this at some length at, uh, at a sexist panel discussion with, with various people uh, a while ago, uh, which is just to have a brief look at the political environment that we're in at the moment. Uh, and, 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 and what opportunities uh, that, that may or, or may not present. Um, I think that in the, in the post-election environment, uh, there certainly are opportunities. Um, to me, the election story in a nutshell, and, and, and some of you have heard this all before, um, is that at the moment, I don't think that the, the, if things stay as they are at the moment, uh, if, if, if political alignments stay as they are at the moment, the African National Congress is in no danger uh, of losing power for at least the next 20 years if you simply do the electoral maths. However, uh, and, and obviously if that is the case, uh, you would expect to find a fair amount of complacency within the ANC. Uh, in a lot of the, the talks I've been giving on the election, I've, I've made the point um, that um, in September last year, uh, there was a very interesting newspaper article which appeared. Well, at the first, first glance, it was an extremely ridiculous newspaper article, uh, as many of them are in this country. But uh, at second glance, it became quite interesting. And the reason it was, it, it was both ridiculous and interesting is that the Sunday Times had got hold of a document which the ANC was distributing to its members of parliament. And the document, which was a secret document, told them that they must be very careful in the run-up to the election, only put to pass legislation which will be popular with voters, uh, which the Sunday Times regarded as quite scandalous. Of course, the reason some of us found this ridiculous is presumably that's what you're supposed to do in an electoral system. You're supposed to appeal to voters. 
However, on reflection, it appeared to be a rather interesting article because there was no record of the ANC ever thinking that passing legislation, which, which, which was popular among voters, was a good idea anyway. It was the first time they ever issued the circular. Uh, and it occurred to us that they were issuing the circular because they were worried about things which they hadn't been worried about before. Uh, quite frankly, I don't believe whatever that the calculation which said, you know, if, if, if we don't actually appeal to people, uh, then uh, we're going to lose votes uh, had actually been part of our political debate uh, until this last election. So it was part of the political debate in the last election. It did lead the ANC, I think, in two directions, the second of which is more interesting perhaps for our discussion this morning than the, uh, the first. I think the first direction it did lead it in, uh, in all sorts of contradictory ways, was the idea uh, that the quality of government mattered, uh, that if it didn't improve the way in which government interacted with citizens, uh, it, would lose, it would lose votes. Uh, the second one is <coughs> that there was a perception within the ANC that they needed to deal with poverty and inequality. Uh, however, a lot of it, as it still is, was very confusing and misleading, and uh, I, I'm sure I don't have to say in this room that when the, you know, when the ANC talks about radical economic transformation, I, I tend to agree with Fulkani and Dare in independent newspapers, whose argument was that the only thing radical about the ANC's proposals at the moment is the way in which they use the word radical, which I think is a is, 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 is fair comment. <laughs> so I don't think uh, that, that, that they're about to suddenly change economic policy, but I think that if you look at the election manifesto and you look at some of the things that were said at the part, there is the idea, the, the idea is now, uh, it had taken root in the ANC before the election that they would have to start engaging with economic power holders, business in particular, uh, on a range of issues which are listed in the manifesto uh, because we needed uh, some sort of uh, uh, change in economic approach and economic policy. Now, the obvious question which needs to be asked in the post-election environment uh, is, is that still on the table? Um, because if, uh, if, if, if the result of the election was simply to demonstrate that the ANC uh, is, uh, is, is in power for the next 20 years, well then that kind of incentive would no longer be there. I, I think the incentive is there, is still there for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that uh, it's months after the election now and you don't need me to point out to you for the umpteenth time that although nationally the ANC uh, is, uh, is, is in reasonably good shape. Uh, in, in several of the metropolitan areas it's, it's in quite poor shape. Um, Nelson Mandela Bay uh, and, and, and in Gauteng. Uh, and yes, uh, as some of us have pointed out, just to, 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 uh, uh, you know, just, just, just to prick a hole in some of the newspaper speculation, no, that doesn't mean the ANC is not going to lose Joburg or Tswane or Nelson Mandela Bay. And the reason the ANC is not going to lose any of those places is because of the way in which the electoral system works, uh, because half the seats are, are ward seats and the ANC has an average in the wards it controls in the major metro of, of, of about 78 to 80 percent. Uh, some of us have done some very crude calculations. If the ANC was to lose Joburg, its vote, share of the vote would have to go down to 35 uh, percent. And similarly in Tswane, which, which clearly is unlikely. Uh, despite that, there is no doubt that uh, losing uh, the urban middle class, which I think the ANC has done, uh, and, and losing its hold over the metros uh, is uh, uh, of concern to the ANC. And I don't think that it's any accident, uh, if, if any of you have been following this, uh, that uh, the, the, the ANC Premier nationally, uh, who has most things to say about all of these issues, who seems to be thinking about these issues more than anybody else, is David Mukukura, who's the Gauteng Premier, who's doing things which no ANC Premier has ever done before, like standing in queues at public hospitals and then coming back to the legislature and saying, gosh, people are treated horribly there, uh, and, and talking about engagement with, with economic power holders, etc. So I think that that is one opening uh, in, 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 the, in, 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 the, in the government space, which is of some interest. Uh, I think the other issue is that I was very careful to say at the beginning uh, of this, this talk, of this, uh, the remarks on the election, uh, that the ANC is in no trouble if things stay the same as they are. But of course the ANC has no guarantee that things will stay the same as they are. And the, thing that the, the issue that the ANC has got to worry about most of all, uh, which it really has to worry about a great deal, 
uh, is the prospect of some sort of workers' party formed by NUMSA or, or, or other sections of the trade union movement. Now, if a workers' party was formed, uh, we have no idea how successful it would be, but it is worth bearing in mind simply as, uh, as something to keep ANC strategists awake at night, uh, that you know, if you look at the electoral math, if a workers' party were to get 10 to 12%, it would deprive the ANC of its majority. Uh, now, if you consider just as, you know, so as, 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 as one example, that COPE in, in five months was able to get 7.5%, uh, having made uh, some very serious blunders, uh, uh, the idea, certainly as a, as, as a working hypothesis, the idea that a, a union-led party could get 10 or 12 percent if it had two or three years and didn't make uh, any major blunders is, is, not, is not fantasy. It's, 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 it's not uh, uh, out of the question. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the ANC does have to worry about a split in its ranks uh, which uh, would, 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 would really imperil its majority. Just to belabor the point, I mean, because it, it, you know, it, does, it does give a, a sort of point to this. Uh, if you, if you, you know, I, I mentioned earlier on the ANC's cold over, over, over various wards in the municipalities. Uh, if you want to know what a split in the ANC would do to that, have a look at what happened in Plokwe. Okay, the, the former Poch of Strip. Because in Plokwe, for a variety of reasons, you had a, a split down the middle in the ANC. You had ANC people running against an independent slate of former ANC councillors. And the ANC average majority in wards in Plokwe went down from 90% to the 50s, okay? I, including three wards which they actually lost to the independents. So that gives you a very graphic idea uh, of what, what the formation of a workers' party could do to the ANC majority. Uh, and that certainly does mean uh, that the ANC uh, has uh, an interest, a continuing interest in the kind of issues which worried it before the election. Now, I, I really, when I talk about opportunities here, I mean, just to get uh, some of the uh, sort of red herrings out of the table. I'm not suggesting for a moment uh, that uh, ANC leadership have suddenly become committed to a comprehensive plan to deal with poverty and inequality in this country. In fact, you may have noticed that over the last three days, uh, you know, senior ANC people have been talking about you know, rather, I think, fantastical ideas about passing legislation to curb strikes. Uh, it is a very confused environment at the moment and will remain a confused environment for quite a while. But quite frankly, from my experience, confused environments are the environments you want to be involved in. Confused environments are the environments in which you want to be speaking uh, because they are environments uh, which obviously can go in a variety of ways, uh, but your, your, your highest prospect uh, of contributing to substantive change, I think very often happens in confused environments. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, the only reason I've carried on this long is that you didn't stop me, um, but I'm going to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. So.